Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, Stephen Fick here. I have an opportunity now to talk with Scott Wilson at Darkwood Armory. He has been making swords for a long time. I uh, don't know how long, but he'll tell us. Uh, he's also a jouster and makes armor and all around good guy. Uh, we've known each other for how long has it been now? 2000? 2004? It was somewhere in the early 2000s that we first met. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it was at in Michigan. I believe, I I believe so. I believe so. Uh, Scott has been my go-to rapier and side sword maker. Uh, I, I remember sending a picture of a German longsword to you. Right. And saying, is two port Saxon Hill. Yeah. I want this, but sized down. And that's back when you were using Del Tin blades. Right. Uh, was that old man Del Tin making those or his boys? Uh, it was him himself. Fulvio was making them at the time. Um, right. I dealt with him a long time. In fact, it, our, our, we only began to part ways when the Euro, the, the European Union started, and they started using the Euro as the Lira, and my price just, just tripled to buy blades. I mean, he was a great blade maker, a fan. You know, I learned a lot from him talking to him, um, but eventually it just wasn't worth my while to buy them from him. Right. I could make them as, as as inexpensively as I could after learning how and developing a process. So, Scott, can you tell us a little bit about Darkwood? Well, sure, sure. Um, Darkwood started, I guess, in my head when I first got in the SCA and I had to figure out how to make my own armor. <laughs> so, as many um, of us did, right? Right, yeah, you couldn't you couldn't actually go out to Walmart and buy anything, and uh, other than maybe some baseball pads and such. And so I got some pamphlets that people had written at the time and mimeographed off, and we um, basically just taught ourselves how to do it. We used jigsaws, cut pieces out. We made dishing stumps. We made round faced hammers and hammered in the dishing stumps and you know, a lot of that hasn't changed. Yeah. You know, a lot of the art. It, it, the, I still have a dishing stump I've had for 20 years. Still gets used weekly, almost every day. <laughs> yeah. And so, when did you start Darkwood? When I started, I started officially on paper in 1996. Wow. Um, we, that was when I started making stuff for sale. Um, and making enough money that I better start a business instead of just call it a hobby. <laughs> right. So uh, we started at 96 um, uh, here in Laurel, Mississippi, and then quickly moved to Panama City, Florida. And we moved, we lived in Panama City, Florida, and ran the business out of Panama City for 10 years, and then moved back here in 2006. We bought this, uh, the building that we're in, in, uh, I'd say it was, at the time, it was 5,000 square feet, I think two 2,500 square foot buildings. We added another, uh, another 20, uh, 20 by 40 building or cover top. So we have quite a bit of area under, under cover here to operate in, which is kind of necessary when you have know leather for part of your products and wood for part of your products and and you have a huge water jet machine to cut things and you have the you know stuff to turn pommels and you, you know all the different machines require a little bit of space of course enormous power requirements um it's you know it's part of being more of an industrial style business than a hobby business i started when I, I started the business as an engineer, and <clears throat> I said even before as an engineer, before I was an engineer, but as an engineer, I made good enough money I could put all of my money back into the business. I was able to take and 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 make good choices, try out new things because I wasn't pushed 
to be making a big profit. I just couldn't lose any money. Right, right. Sometimes losing money a little bit meant I got, you know, discount on my taxes. So it worked out in my favor there. But eventually we went bigger and bigger and the business became, you know, really pretty, you know, a, a, a a substantial sized business you know it was it was no longer just a hobby thing where people think of hobbies we've taken on a scale that became you know semi-industrial and it's and it still is and we do you know we haven't done as much business this is a little bit down as you might expect <laughs> but um we've we've done pretty well over the years to improve our product and be able to make you know nice good quality fencing equipment and expand into, you know, jousting armor and, and, uh, um, you know, steel harness fighting armor and, you know, things like that. We, for even for a brief while, we did, we did mail. So we got away from that. Yeah, we did mail for a little while. I had a guy, we, we bought out, uh, the guy at Atlanta Armory and bought his patterns and his tools and, and such and is and and the problem is it's a it's a great business if you're really really good at it and fast and you have no overhead at all right and you know, the reason <laughs> the, i always called it insane mail yeah no i i reached a point in my life where i decided it wasn't worth the time or the insanity to make my own anymore right so what do you, I mean, you obviously you enjoy doing all of the different types of weapons that you do. Sure, I'll sure. Do awesome. But what are some of the weapons that you enjoy making most? Well, I'd, I'd have to say it's probably the more intricate rapiers because I have a lot of experience doing it. So whenever I get a chance to do one, it's a chance to push myself to be able to really, you know, concentrate on something I'm good at and rise to a different level. I mean, I don't, don't get me wrong. I like challenges and trying stuff that's new, but it's really cool to be able to push myself to, to my limits, but most people's budget doesn't really afford that. <laughs> I remember back in Michigan at the International Sword Martial Arts Convention with yeah. Jared Kirby, John Lennox. Everybody called it ISMAC, except I, except for me. I always thought it was more appropriate to pronounce it as ISMAC. I mean, it is a sword class, a sword workshop. <laughs> but there at ISMAC, you showed up with these little beauties. And I remember getting these. Uh, the thing I like about them is that they're all pierced and then have copper pounded into it. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, it's got a little bit of love to it now. And yes. It needs some refurbishing. So I'm going to be sending it back to you, but uh, <laughs> this one, when I bought this set, I don't know if you remember this, but everybody kept trying to steal it from me. Yeah, I remember. Everyone was very, very uh, upset that you got to it first. Actually, yeah. you know, I thought I think you actually bought that at. Did you buy that at in in up in in the uh, WMAW that was not that was before they used to hold it all the time at at the Coven? It was the weird one up in New York. Oh, at Amsterdam. Yo, you know what? You're right. It might have been at yeah Amsterdam. Because I think that's where my pictures I, that I lost are from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kirby kept trying to, I, they showed up in Kirby's sword bag at one point. Uh -huh. I don't know how they got here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my, my wife, on the other hand, when I called her and told her that that thousand dollars I just earned at the Renaissance Fair performing is now oh. gone, was less than pleased uh, but I said I, it was well spent <laughs> well yeah it's tough to to throw down uh 
<clears throat> grand without the wife knowing and being uh, let's just say it's it's best to inform them of our intention <laughs> yeah um, it's actually very easy to do the repercussions on the other hand are very hard to live with oh indeed indeed <laughs> uh yeah and so i remember the first scratch i got on this set was from cecil longino <laughs> He was doing Spanish rapier and he threw this cut at my head. So I went into a uh, face guard, Wazi de Fasha, and took it right on the hill and went <gasps> and looked at it and then he hit me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the problem with them. Well, I just took a, a set today and refurbished them for a SCA couple who reigned as king and queen and they're both chivalry in the SCA and they own a honest to God castle, but have had the most uh, unfortunate thing to have their castle burned down. No, did it really? Yes, yes. Oh. The folks and they had an electrical problem. They really they did a lot of research on the thing is decorated in, in uh, um, the proper fashion and they divided out parts of it that's real medieval. And they have the SCA over all the time to their property to do events. But uh, something happened and the darn thing caught fire. And we managed to, they sent the, us their old swords that were in the, in the fire that gotten uh, uh, water on them from the hosts. Put the fire out and then sat in it for a long time and rusted. So right. we refurbished all their stuff and already got it back to them. Wow, I, I can't even imagine the pain at having something like that happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be rough. I mean, we're sitting here on the biggest tornadoes that uh, the country has seen since Joplin. And it is, it is horrendous. I've been out there every couple of days trying to do a little bit um, to, you know, help, help some folks, whatever you can. I mean, it's so much to do, it is indescribable. But I can't tell you how proud I am to be in a place where all these people just get together. I have not heard of anyone's needs going unmet. That's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And, and I just hope it continues because it's going to take a, a long time. Right, I'm, especially with the shutdown. Yeah, and then this, the swath of destruction is just... It, it, like I said, it's unimaginable. I've, I've been here all my life. I've seen lots of tornadoes. Seen them. I mean, they come through and, and you see some flipped over cars and you see wrecked trees and you see a, a patch a hundred yards wide of trees twisted and off at the tops. And this is a mile wide of that. Trees this big around, twisted off, tumped over. Um, you know, houses, the roofs ripped off. Some houses just completely knocked off the slab. Some, some, you know, uh, mobile homes thrown. They had to saw a mobile home in half because it landed across the road. Wow. And it's so impressive that you and everyone else are just pulling together to help the whole community. So... You know, as a as a jouster, as a knight, I mean, that's that's great. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think uh, I'm I'm not the only one, and and that's the best part. Yeah. You know, uh, first thing I thought of was, what can I do? I can grab a chainsaw and go help. Well, you know, you couldn't find a place to park because of every bubba's that you know their Corona buddies are jumping in there in in the truck with their chainsaw and. I mean, it's buzzing and roads are cut through. Roads were cut through the afternoon before nightfall in most of Jones County. Wow. Yeah, that's how, that's how fast. In fact, I know a guy that rushed down to help his, his aunt when their trailer got flipped over. He was driving from a nor northern town in Lewin, and he drove down to her, and then on the way home, he, did, he discovered that another, uh, uh, the second tornado had come, and it was north of him, so he couldn't get home on the route that he had planned because 
there's another tor set of tornado damage. And so we had to hop out there and start helping to cut the roads to get back home, to go to sleep, to get up in the morning, to drive back and do it again. You know, it's only about a 40 minute drive normally. <laughs> right. Well, like I said to you earlier, I think I'll stick with my little shakers here in California. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, when it when they start tumbling around, it gets real bad there too. So, <laughs> so I noticed on the back wall you have it looks like a 1796 or style uh, saber, but that looks like a later period, so eight or uh, 19th century. Is that I would eight or is that an original? Um, I think it is an original. Um, it is. It's a piece that was given to me, but it's short. <clears throat> it's actually kind of short for a um, anything but a naval cutlass. <laughs> I'll get back up here and see if I can show this off. You know, it's it's not it's not real long. It's not in great shape or anything like that. But yeah. uh, oh. It still would uh, it do you in without any question. I mean, I wouldn't have to be that sharp, and it's made thin. It's 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 nice and light. Right. Yeah. It's it's amazing how nice they are. And when you're wow, yeah. When you're making your swords, we, you obviously can't make them with that distal taper. And uh, some of them that I've handled have uh, at the point they're less than half a millimeter thick. You obviously can't do that for the swords that we are going to stab each other with. Correct. But how do you decide how thick or robust to make <laughs> a sword so that it's usable but not overly built? Okay, well, you know, that's oftentimes determined by what the customer's asking for because it's it, it is absolutely that you know the thinner and lighter it is at the tip the uh, the more it moves around the more agile it is and in reality the deeper it stick the heart the better it cut those thin cross sections they do the job yeah but um they're also fragile when they're not going in you start stabbing somebody with a very thin sword and it doesn't just slice right into the flesh and bends it might kink especially if you're thrusting pretty fast in fact i have a uh, a really nice small sword up here from well it's actually i'm sorry not so it's the droom from uh the american uh, revolutionary war time period almost dead on And this is something that I would uh, definitely consider to, to use to <clears throat> save myself in any situation. It's so light and fast. It's very nice. Yeah, now notice it has a little kink on the end where it, it hit some, something, somebody was playing around with it and, and uh, thrust, but it is so thin here. Yeah. I've tried to make uh, blades to have, mimic the feel of this, and they end up looking very much more like modern sabers than you would expect. Yeah, in, order, yeah. in order to get them thin enough and yet robust enough to work. And so you end up, what you the way to make the best blade for practice is to, to throw out the whole concept of it trying to look like a blade itself. What you want it to do is actually function as much like the sharp blade and yet provide the most safety and robustness that you can get. And that generally means not adopting historical cross sections, except historical practice cross sections, which tend to be rectangular. Because the rectangular gives you a sharp edge on four corners to allow you to feel some edge, which I think is really important when you fence. Less so the farther down the, you know, from the from uh, medieval to Renaissance. In medieval people really use the touch, the feeling of the edge, whereas Renaissance 
use the, what they learned about how the feeling should tell you what you should do and just look at it, you know, use your vision. And so it became less important. But I think it's real important as soon as the blades touch that you're able to feel how hard edges bite on, especially on soft backs, on, on corners or whatever. And so that's one of my reasons for generally wanting very square edge blades. But I think most people, when I do my fetters like that, they don't like them because they'll nick. So I've, I've, I've quit using, doing that for blades that are used by people who are more interested in, in fighting in tournaments than they are in learning how to handle a sharp weapon. Right, right, okay. Um, over at my school, we have a lot of your swords. Yeah. And there's a number of Schiavona there. When you do a complex hilt, like a Schiavona or a, like, you know, a, a three ring port, something like this, do you cut out all the individual pieces and then put it together like a jigsaw puzzle? Or do you cut it out on like a, a, a flat plate and then fold it? Something in between. Okay. Or is this a trade secret that we don't want to talk about? No, no, it's fine. But you're absolutely right. Something in between. I, I cut it into the biggest pieces that can be used to assemble things together to make it come together as fast as possible, look as historical as possible. Okay, so you, you, it's something in between. You know, like a Schiavona, I don't cut out each individual piece, but I don't think they did either. Now, my method is not the way they would have done it. They would have cut and done their, their patterns differently had they been doing them with a, you know, hot and with a, uh, with, you know, by hammer. So since I'm welding with, with arc welders, I'm going to, I'm going to set my pattern up differently, even though I want exactly the same result. And right. I do for my weld so that we end up having the interior structure look as closely to historical welded uh, pieces as possible. That's one of the things I wanted to tell you. I've always really appreciated about your, your swords. The welds are so clean. As opposed to some I've seen, uh, they're they're beautiful welds and they're nice to see and they don't catch on gloves or hands or look ugly. Because I mean, I don't personally want my swords to look ugly because right. I, I'm not in a social position where I would have a run of the mill, knock it out in two hours. Here, go fight somebody. And so I really appreciate all the work you put into it. Uh, we have a couple of your early longsword fetter-esque swords. Okay. Um, what, uh, so you were saying you like challenges in your sword, but you've also been doing armor and you joust. And right. If I remember correctly, you run an event once a year as well. I actually run, used to run more than one event. Actually, we run <clears throat> sometimes as many as four events a year. That's insane. Yeah, well, they're, they're for our group, you know, my little group that gets together to help me, my squires and hangers on. Um, you know, I do a birthday party uh, every year, which is it's a chance to do martial experimentation um we've had a lot of horses we've done horse mounted charges at uh at infantry it had infantry and armor and with pike and had and charged down the line and thrown and so we had a chance to do these things try them out on you know small scale but a bigger scale and with, with no preconceived no you know not not uh it's just a party Let's try this out. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of harness fighting. 
Um, this, you know, and every year the theme kind of changes. I might have something else that, that needs to happen differently. This last year was a challenge, but we started doing an autumn fair, which is a, um, an actual rent fair to get people to come in and help pay, pay some of the costs to improve and maintain the site. Okay. Now, last year we didn't, you know, we really, I was concerned about, um, Part, we still have some issues with parking and, and this and that. We don't know how, many, how much advertising to do. So I did very limiting, limited advertising. We had about 75 people come in. Everybody seemed to really enjoy it. And so we will probably do it again next year. Right. But running it and then my birthday party, you know, in, in, in a ba basically three months apart is pretty, pretty tough. So but it's the best weekend to get. <laughs> Right. So what you're saying is when people talking about having a birthday bash, you go all the way for a birthday bash. I do try to go all the way for the birthday bash. You know, I feed people and try to put them up and, you know, at least set them up with camping spots. We, you know, I have hookups for the people's trailers. A lot of people have living quarters in their trailers. So, so when they come in, I have a place where they park and we can hook them up to the uh, electricity i've got a bunkhouse and and uh two bathrooms there and and we've got you know extra stalls and uh we've been trying to you know build a community around people who are really excited about doing you know the middle ages as you know as close as we can in in these items especially marshley you know to me it's been a lifelong dream to be a knight in as much in as many ways as I could, you know, to own a, a properly fitting, you know, suit of armor, to uh, to joust, to fight in it, um, to have the right clothing and understand the basic culture of knighthood from the Middle Ages. That's you know, that's you know, I, so I used to be really interested in the samurai, and then one day I thought. You know, why am I doing samurai stuff? I want to learn about knights. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Jeffrey de Charnay's book. On right. Knights. Fabulous book. Um, when you are doing your armor and your swords, uh, oh, actually, before I go there, I wanted to tell you about one of my experiences. I don't ride horses. I don't think anything that big should have a brain. And they scare me. Uh, but I was in, uh, I go to Europe to get my fix for medieval battles. And I was at Bosworth Field fighting. And I got hit, went down. What I didn't realize is that when I went down, I ended up in the horse lane. So as I'm laying there, dead four horses are charging down on me and i can just feel the ground vibrating under me and i'm actually bouncing on the ground there's so much force coming through it and for those of you watching this if, if you've never been in front of charging horses and i hope you never do it on accident it is a terrifying place to be but i'm laying there and i stick my head in the ground you know, because there's nothing else I can do and start whispering to myself, horses don't like to step on people. Horses don't like to step on people. And they, they're charging down on me. They split, go around me and come back together. And all of a sudden I was miraculously healed and I could crawl out of that area. And that's the closest I've ever been into a charge and the closest I ever want to be. <laughs> well, I like the experience. Over you. <laughs> at least they didn't have fun with you and jump over you yeah right uh and then for you and armor and knights because i do i do the whole knighthood thing but i'm very english in my in my way of doing it all on foot and the thing about armor is how well it works when i was there at bosworth field again one of the guys came down off his horse in the melee, the horse fight, and horse stepped on his head. And the Salay helmet, the Salat salad helmet, saved him. And it's 
amazing how well it works. How yeah, many suits does, of armor? Uh, What's that? Does its job. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, I have found that one suit of armor isn't enough. I now have four suits of armor as I progressed. Okay. What about yourself? How many suits do you have? Complete suits right now, only one. Well, I could have two in, in a day if I spent the time to put one back together. It's in my first kit, the my original, uh, um, the, the Italian exports, the German market, the Gothic is, uh, needs to be cleaned up. It needs to be, you know, completely taken apart, re-leathered. Uh, some of the plates uh, need to be replaced and some work needs to be done and put back to, to work in order. Um, and then I have about, I got a, a lot of pieces done on a really nice set of Gothic and it's in the 410. And then I have a, about, I don't know, a third of a 1410 English suit that I'm working on that's out there that's not even ready to be heat treated because I don't have any help anymore. So I have to work on everybody else's stuff. So, you know, I used to even get all the guys to work on like my rolling my edges and stuff. And so now when I have to roll my own edges, I have to take a day off after hammering, you know, repeatedly. I, I just can't do it. I usually get the guys to do all the super repetitive stuff. Right. That's, uh, that's what uh, apprentices are for, right? That's, that, that's exactly what I use them for. <laughs> they are my arm. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So my last question I'd like to ask is, uh, any memories of events that we've been at together, anything stick out in your mind from, the, from our past? Um... I don't know. I, I, I really enjoyed our time in California when I came down to uh, what was those uh, the, the, the two events that we did there. That's right. That was uh, that was early WMAW in uh, right on the side of the bridge. It was the Benicia. Yeah. Uh, and one was in Livermore and one was in Benicia. That was the year that John Clements showed up too. At Benicia. Yeah. That's that's right. I forgot you were at Venetia. Good yep. time. That was also the year Paul McDonald was there, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, it was Paul at, was he in Livermore? Yeah. No, he was at Venetia. I don't remember him being at Venetia when, when uh, Clemens was there. Yeah, well, yeah. it was, it was some good times. Yeah. Um, I want to Scott, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to chat with me uh, for, again, making such lovely pieces. Uh, I'm going to be sending these to you. Uh, my side sword, the two-port cross that I had you made. Uh, my Delchin blade has broken four times at the tang. Oh. I've had it welded three times. And I think it's finally time to retire that one and maybe get a new blade for it. Okay, well, uh, I know somebody who can make you one. <laughs> <He's not expensive. laughs> In fact, if I remember correctly, this sword was one of the first rapier blades that you made after going away from Del 10. Might be. I Might be. Yeah. So we did fancy stuff once we made our own blades we tried that's when we were doing some higher end pieces yeah and so yeah i think that's one of your first blades and it served me well oh good uh I actually uh because that's the one i competed with in all my tournaments right yeah yep. okay. <laughs> i want to thank you very much for joining me it's always a pleasure to talk to you my friend it's well, good to see you and Hopefully, we'll get a chance to talk uh, much longer again sooner and maybe one day in person. <laughs> oh, I hope so. I'm looking forward to it. <clears throat> Thanks for spending the time with me. I really enjoyed talking to you, and we will talk again soon. Okay, sounds good.